welcome to another edition of IDS Talks. My name is Hunter McMahon, and today we're joined by Jeff Rosenthal, a partner at Blank Rome, to talk about the recent Illinois Supreme Court opinion involving BIPA, or the Biometric Information Privacy Act. Thanks for joining us, Jeff. My pleasure to be here, Hunter. Thanks for having me. Now, before we get started, a quick intro on yourself, if you would be so kind. Absolutely. So I am a partner in the Corporate Litigation Department of Blank Rome. I lead our biometric privacy practice, which is probably why you've asked me to join today. And I have been uh, both litigating biometric cases and advising clients on compliance matters, related compliance matters, for several years now. Prior to that, I have had a robust and complex uh, class action and privacy defense practice. And uh, that's what brings me here today to talk to you. Awesome. Now, it's a pretty big opinion. It's got some significant implications. Uh, can you give us the 60 to 90 second summary on it? Sure. So we're here today talking about the Cothran versus White Castle Systems case involving biometrics, which for those who may not be familiar with the term, biometrics is technology that allows for the identification or authentication of people using immutable or unchangeable characteristics their eyes, their voice, their face, their fingerprints, their palm, any number of uh, different ways that, that systems can identify who is being presented in front of a screen. The most common example I use is if you have an iPhone and you use either touch ID for your fingerprint or face ID with your face, congratulations, you've just been a part of biometric collection and that is how the technology works to unlock when you stick your face in front of your phone versus somebody else. So that's what biometrics is and kind of working backwards from the Cothran case, which was decided last Friday, the issue there was the employee of White Castle, the, the restaurant chain White Castle, was using a fingerprint scanner, uh, we call them bio clocks or biometric time clocks, to clock in and out of work. Importantly, they were located in Illinois which is the only state in the country that has a biometric privacy law with a private right of action, which we'll talk about. Two other states have laws, Texas and Washington state, but they do not have private rights of action. So you don't see the level of, of litigation and, and jurisprudence coming out of those jurisdictions like you do in Illinois. So back to Catherine. Catherine involved an employee of White Castle who was using the bio clocks to, to clock in and out of work and the allegations from the plaintiff, Catherine, was that there was a lack of conformity with the, the statute. The statute is called the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act, or BIPA for short, Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act. So the claim is that there was a BIPA violation that happened whereby White Castle was not obtaining consent for the collection of biometrics. You have to basically get informed consent before collection occurs and did not have policies in place describing how the data is used, stored, whether it's sold, deleted, et cetera. So both of those subsections of the BIPA statute were alleged to have been violated. This was back in December of 2018 when White Castle was sued in Illinois State Court. The case took uh, several interesting and, and unusual procedural moves where in January of 2019, it was removed to the Northern District of Illinois, the Federal District Court, in Illinois, in August of 2020, uh, the judge ruled that Cothran had multiple timely violations. By November 2020, an interlocutory uh, review petition was reviewed and approved by the Seventh Circuit. So now we're up in the Seventh Circuit in November of 2020. September 2021, oral arguments happened in the Seventh Circuit. And then in December of 2021, the Seventh Circuit decides, you know what, there's too much importance associated with this issue. There's too much Illinois policy and, and, and law at stake here. We are going to certify the question presented to the Seventh Circuit back to the Illinois Supreme Court or to the Illinois Supreme Court to be ultimately decided. And that's what happened. An oral argument in the Illinois Supreme Court happened in May of 2022. And as I mentioned last Friday, finally, the decision was issued in Cothran. So Cothran is significant because of what it says, but also how it got there. Essentially, the takeaway from Catherine is 
before Cawthra came around, there was an open air, open question in this area of the law about what is a violation under BIPA? Using the fingerprint example, is it the first time an employee scans their finger and then they've had a violation, they've been harmed by the, the statute? Or is it every time the scanning occurs, every time the fingerprint is scanned? And as you might imagine, that's a pretty significant difference because you're looking at their statutory damages associated with the statute of $1,000 per violation or $5,000 if it is a willful or knowing violation. So the question becomes then, are you looking at $1,000 per employee or $1,000 per scan per employee up to you know four times a day if they're clocking in and out for lunch as well? And you could see how that has a significant multiplier effect. And what happened in Cothran was the Supreme Court of Illinois in a split 4-3 decision came down and said every scan, every collection is a separate violation. So right there, it's an unknown multiplier that has really changed the landscape and the, the upward liability, which was already pretty significant in these cases, essentially through the roof. So I know having analyzed hundreds of millions of records on some of these cases, helping clients understand who was potentially in violation or, or, or had not given that uh, secondary informed consent, as well as how many occurrences, this is a significant change in likely how things are negotiated for settlement, but also, I mean, potential damage exposures for clients, is it not? I think that's exactly right. It, it affects you know, several cases where stayed pending this ruling, Catherine and, and some other ones as well. We, we don't need to get too far into the weeds on it, but there was another case decided two weeks ago uh, called Tim's versus Black Horse Carriers. And what Tim said, also by the Illinois Supreme Court, and what Tim said is there was a separate question about what is the applicable statute of limitations to BIPA. Previously, had an uh, intermediate appellate court said one year, but again, the Illinois Supreme Court said five years. So within two weeks, the Illinois Supreme Court has now said it's a five-year statute of limitations, which means additional claims that would have been untimely could now be considered timely if they fell outside the one-year statute of limitations, and every scan is a separate violation. So you take those two factors, right off the TIMS alone quintupled the exposure if you're looking at one year versus five years of collection, and then Cothran comes around and says every scan within that five-year period is a separate violation. So to answer your question, it changed a lot of the landscape. It's a, they're, they're twin significant rulings. And again, they came within two weeks of each other, but it certainly changes the calculus from just a claim evaluation standpoint. I'm sure the plaintiff's bar is, is doing the same thing, but as far as the defense side, when we look at these cases and we have, you know, clients want to know what's our exposure, what could this cost, what, what's the damages, potential damages, we have to go through this discussion now. We have to say, have you been collecting more than five years or more than one year into five years? How many scans are we talking about? So it definitely has changed the narrative uh, associated with these cases. I mean, you talk in one to five years, there's a significant technological change that usually happens between those times because rarely is somebody on the exact same same systems for five years now you're trying to layer together multiple data sources understanding how people consented on one or maybe got a secondary consent on a different one because the notice of use was different i mean you just that expansion in time alone is, is rife with complications from a data side i think that's exactly right a lot of things can happen in five years including uh, employees leaving who may have known the system better maybe multiple different uh, vendors could be involved over a five-year period and you've got to reassess each one's you know procedures and, and and like you said the consent collection processes and it includes just a lot more data for you I mean, five times the data essentially if, if you've been operating for more than five years collecting biometrics and that puts a lot of strain on companies to just like yourselves and, and the clients themselves to have to sift through that information. So it's it again. It's kind of a one-two punch. You know, we we talk about Cawthorn versus White Castle and Tim's versus Black Horse Carrier. So we're calling it the black and white rulings <laughs> and, and what they've done. A trademark pending. But there we uh, go. yeah, it's there we it's, go. it's really been it's really been uh, significant over the last couple of weeks in this space. 
So real quick, uh, uh, to close this out, I'm kind of curious, what, what kind of chilling effect do you think this will have on companies adopting this technology? It's a great question. And it's a little bit, there's somewhat of irony involved in all this too. So, so just a quick history lesson. BIPA was passed in 2008. And the reason it was passed was because, and this is right in the, the legislative history, there was a company called Pay by Touch that went bankrupt. And they had been collecting biometric information, I believe fingerprints. And then the question becomes, well, this company has gone bankrupt and it has all of this data. And let's assume that it, it did things the right way and collected consent. Well, now it's bankrupt and someone else is gonna potentially buy it and uh, obtain it. That company too, who knows what their pro policies are like or their protections or, or they have any connection to these consumers who have given information to pay by touch. So BIPA comes along and says, because of this scenario, we want to build in protections and give, and give users and customers some assurances about how their data is going to be treated. So it all started from a bankruptcy. Ironically, now, that was 2008, now we're in 2023, there's a concern that rulings like Cothran and the, the exponential increase in damages that companies are going to face could put companies into bankruptcy companies that have biometric data. So we've kind of come full circle uh, in, in a situation where you could very well find companies that have done the right thing and collected data and biometric data specifically be put into bankruptcy because of the you know, existential threat that these BIPA cases could present to certain, certain uh, defendants. So it's a little ironic there that we're now seeing a situation like this play out. But what's also very interesting is within the Cothran opinion itself, this very issue came up. In fact, it's it's rare to see justices or really any judge talking about these uh, the impact on the business community. But there is a significant discussion that happens at the end of the Cothran opinion of the majority, where essentially the justices say, we recognize, and, and Amicus and others have certainly made this point to the justices, that this ruling Cothran will have impacts on the business community and, and users of, of collectors of biometric data and users of biometric data, you know, people who provide it. And essentially what the justices say in the, the majority, the four justice majority says, we recognize that, but we have to apply the law as written. This is how we read the law as written. It, it, we agree with plaintiff in this sense of, of every scan being a separate violation. And that also means that untimely claims can now you know, be considered timely. So there's kind of two expansions going on, but it's essentially that the opinion just says at the end, if, uh, if there's a concern over that, look to the legislature, you know, the legislature is the one who's going to rebalance the scales if that's the concern and the, and the dissent, which included the chief justice really hits that point as well, which is to say, this will undoubtedly have an impact on the business community, but we, the justices aren't the ones to make that call that's got to come from the legislature. And again, that's that's an unusual thing to see in an opinion. It, it certainly has happened before, but you know, a, a ruling of this significance, uh, it, it's it's both telling, but also understandable. I mean, your justices aren't supposed to be writing the law. They have to interpret it as, as presented. And the one other thing I would say about, you know, a chilling effect, or maybe two things, but the chilling effect, there, there's one silver lining in the Cawthorn opinion that the defense bar is looking to, which is essentially that the justice has said, even though there are these statutory damages of a thousand or $5,000, it is a discretionary damage option. So, so judges can still decide whether to impose the full amount. Now, granted, I don't know a single defendant who wants to roll those dice and wait and find out for a judge to decide whether it's discretionary or, or the full statutory damages, but at least that's something defense counsel could point to and say, Here, here's some silver lining uh, coming out of Cothran. And the last point is even BIPA itself and the statute itself talks about encouraging the use of this technology. They want it to be used. It has incredible benefits for safety, efficiency, accuracy. So as I explained to clients and, and really anyone who will listen, Biometrics are, are po these are, po this is a positive technology. This can change lives, this can change security, safety, all these benefits to it. So it's never about not using biometrics, it's about using them responsibly and, and in compliance with the law. But I think as you say, 
there very well could be a chilling effect from rulings of this nature where companies say, yeah, we're getting a lot of benefits from biometric collection, but is it really worth it compared to the potential exposure that rulings like Catherine and Tim's and, and who knows what's coming next could have? So could there be a chilling effect? Certainly, but hopefully there isn't because, again, of all the benefits that go along with collecting biometric data the right way. Well, speaking of listeners, I want to thank everybody that's tuned in today or on our regular subscribers. Jeff, thanks for joining us. If you'd like to learn more about IDS or subscribe, go to IDSINC.com or wherever you normally get your podcast. And we'll see you on the next edition of IDS Talks, talking about something, well, probably about data because that's our fun zone. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.